Hello everyone, my name is Sheridan Plummer of First National Bank and welcome to First National Banknotes. So, if you were born yesterday and don't know about banknotes, this program goes back almost seven years ago and was especially designed to give you, our viewers and customers, a deeper insight into what we do and who we are as a bank. In today's headline, we're going to be looking at highlights from the 2018 Stanley French Shareholder Education Forum on the very important subject of de-risking. If the term doesn't quite ring a bell, then I would suggest you stick around to find out more information. After all, knowledge is power, right? Stay tuned for the details of this new 2018 edition of First National Banknotes. A vision anticipates what may become reality. With First Future Land Loans from First National Bank, you too can envision your future home. All you need is 5% deposit and we'll give you an attractive repayment plan of up to 20 years. Plus more great benefits if you build with us within the first 5 years. Our lending process is quick and hassle-free. Buy the land for your dream home today. Your future starts right now with First Future Land Loans from First National Bank. First National Bank, here for you. First National Bank hosted the annual Stanley Friends Shareholder Education Forum to enlighten and empower shareholders with information about local, regional and international economic developments which can positively or negatively affect them and the bank. The keynote speaker for this year's forum was no other than the bank's current managing director, Mr. Jonathan Johannes. Here's part one of his presentation, moderated by Deloindy Charles. I'm going to ask a few questions of Jonathan and he's going to impart his knowledge on de-risking. And the first thing I'm going to ask is about the background of de-risking. We've heard of it, but what is it? Give us a snapshot of the current situation. Well, de-risking is, is not as simple as the term sounds. It's a, a, an effort by correspondent banks, and by correspondent banks I'm referring to international banks that we use to move monies across the globe. So to get money from St. Lucia to the United States of America, it leaves First National and it goes to an American bank, which is our correspondent bank. And from that bank, it goes off to whichever bank account at whichever bank in whichever state that you want to send those funds to. Over the past few years, you have seen a number of these correspondent banks coming out of their relationships with primarily the indigenous banks in the Caribbean region. And what that does is that it cuts us off from the international markets. So a family member seeking to pay tuition fees for their son at university in the States has no way to send that money to the banks in America. A merchant seeking to pay their supplier has no way of sending those funds to the United States of America. Um, the situation with de-risking is, is such that the smaller indigenous banks face the highest potential of being de-risked because the Canadian banks form part of larger organizations. So they have the backing of Scotia internationally, RBC internationally, and CIBC. We, on the other hand, must fight for every relationship that we have. And throughout the Caribbean, we are seeing economies suffering because of de-risking. So it's, it's, it's not a situation to be taken lightly, but it's one that I feel is going under the radar and not many people understand it or appreciate the ramifications of a de-risked country. When did the movement to de-risk in the Caribbean start and what, what contributed to this increase? Well, I, I'm being put on the spot here today, but I'm in a friendly environment, so I'll answer as honestly as I can. Um, we use the term de-risking in the industry, but behind closed doors I like to call it de-costing. And the reason why I call it de-costing is that 
everything comes down to dollars and cents. And if those international correspondent banks could find a way to make astronomical profits by providing us this service, they would not be de-risking us, let's face it, right? Um, so I call it de-costing. We are cost. We're not bringing in enough revenue, so they're getting rid of us under the guise of de-risking. I say under the guise of de-risking because the definition states that doing that foreign transactions with those backwater banks in the Caribbean and in some questionable jurisdictions will open us up to risk and fines. But when we actually do the research, the hundreds of billions of dollars of fines imposed on these international banks for questionable practices haven't originated in the Caribbean. Okay? There is not one single case of an indigenous Caribbean institution conducting transactions with a correspondent bank that has led to it being fined by the United States regulators. None at all. So, in my estimation, it must be a, a, a question of are these banks profiting from this arrangement? Are the profits significant enough for them? Because of the regulations that have been imposed, I say no. I say they have too much monitoring to do. They have too many people to hire to look at our accounts. So it's easier to just get rid of these smaller banks. And this whole movement would have started, I would say, really came to the fore maybe about five years ago. Um, but now you have people doing studies like the IMF, I think the IMF just published a study in 2016 on the impact that it's having on our economies. And as, it irks me when I read those papers because an organization like the IMF, the World Bank, they have the power to do something about it. But they just satisfied putting out academic papers. So I'll say one last thing on this whole de-risking point before I, I, I turn over to D one more time. Um, you speak to people about de-risking and they say it's to strengthen the banking sector. It's to strengthen the global financial sector. So if we go back to what Claret's presentation spoke about, it's to keep bad money out of the system. It's another layer of protecting us from money laundering. And Cutting off economies was never part of the plan. That's not what it was designed to do. Well, when I get the opportunity to speak to those people who make those comments, I always say to them, if I design a system to perform a particular function and there's an undesired effect, I need to go back to the drawing board and fix it. The fact that no one is going back to the drawing board to fix it is the undesired effect truly undesired? Or was it a consequence that we never realized would happen, but we're happy it's happening? Because it's keeping countries out. It's keeping players out of our marketplace. So there, there's a lot that we can see in terms of the the, the, this whole de-risking and whether it really is de-risking, but I would like to think of it as de-costing. Yeah. I think all of the shareholders probably want to know how you would assess First National's relationship with your correspondent banks. <laughs> okay, so um, correspondent banking relations is something that keeps me up at night. Okay. Um, in banking, and from Claret's presentation, you would have seen that, okay, our MD could go to jail, our employees can go to jail, directors could go to jail. There's a lot that we manage in addition to keeping shareholders happy by driving up dividends and making profits, right? So there's a lot that we do every day. And a lot of it is within our control. So we could get more ATMs, improve the technology, get more aggressive with our sales, instill a performance management culture, and all of that is within our control every day. But the whole idea of de-risking and correspondent banking is one where we lose control. It's not all up to us. Um, what we try to do as First National 
is to maintain strong controls and policies, as Claret would have highlighted, and maintain close relationship with every single correspondent banker that we have. Thankfully, we have done a masterful job at maintaining great relations with Bank of New York. Claret Taylor and her team are, 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 are the key contacts for our, our correspondents, and they had nothing but glowing remarks when we met a couple weeks ago in Santo Domingo. Nothing but glowing remarks about our robust compliance program, <laughs> about the due diligence we perform, and the confidence that they have in our management team at First National, and that goes a long way. A number of our sister institutions in Montserrat and in Nevis and in Belize don't have a single correspondent bank today, but we do as First National, and we must guard it dearly. I say it keeps me up at night because as much work as we do to maintain that relationship, it can be undone in the blink of an eye. And it could be undone not by our actions, but by actions of our politicians, our opposition, and the general public. Because it's possible to de-risk a bank, but it's also possible to de-risk an entire country. So you would have seen some blacklisted countries in the last presentation, and I think I heard a collective gasp when people saw Trinidad's name in that um, other mentioned category. Well, Trinidad got on that list because of delays in passing legislation, because of delays in their compliance with FATCA. And for those who don't know, FATCA is uh, Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. And in a nutshell, what it is is that we must supply to the IRS information on all U.S. citizens and their foreign assets. So Trinidad took a long time to comply with that regulation, and as such, they made it onto that list. That's one way that political action could lead to a correspondent bank saying, hey, I don't want to deal with this country. But what's becoming more of a concern for me lately, and, and, and I hope it becomes a concern for everyone in the room, is what we say. Now, WikiLeaks would have taught us that what we say in St. Lucia is being listened to by the U.S. Embassy, by Washington, by, by international intelligence agencies. And it's no longer a case where we could say something in cash trees today and it takes a week to get the view for. Whatever we say in our marketplace gets out into the international arena almost instantaneously. And you would be surprised that your correspondent banks, our correspondent banks, pick up stuff from the newswires. So when they hear of allegations of corruption in government, of ministers accepting bribes, of, of statements being made to score political mileage locally, without any evidence, yeah? We understand what's happening in St. Lucia. But the president of Bank of New York picks up and reads all of this about St. Lucia and says, oh my God, it's a lawless country. They have lax controls. They don't care about due diligence. We need to get out of there fast. A retraction in the media does not correct that situation. And First National, for all the good work we have put in, cannot control the fact that this institution is leaving because of the macro environment. So it's, it's, it's tough times for us as a bank, but we continue to do what we can. And we recognize that one of the key things for us to do, to answer your question in terms of not only building relations with our bank, but educating the public to the risk of de-risking. Because I believe that the more people who know about it, is the more people who will talk about it, and the more people who will advocate for things to be done about it. Yeah?
which is why this is about real news and not fake news, <laughs> because we hope we're going to take this message out into the public domain accurately, because there is a lot of misconception yeah. around. It's a, it's a coincidence that my next question is about um, perception and perception of perhaps not the highest level of um, regulated program. And I wanted to ask about citizenship by investment programs wow. and the Im impact that the perception of those in the Caribbean may have on correspondent banks who are already looking to de-risk us. Henley and Partners earlier this year ranked eight global citizenship programs and the Caribbean were the bottom five. St. Lucia was seven out of eight. Dominica was behind them and I assume it was before the hurricane, but you could certainly expect it to be. So the question I have, is there a negative perception of these well, countries well, based on questionable CIP programs that can further impact correspondent banks in their de-risking strategies? Thank God for a friendly environment, right? <laughs> so. This, this, this is getting very controversial, but it's a good question. Yes. But before I answer the question, it, 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 it has me thinking of something else about de-risking. De-risking has the potential to kill an industry, okay? So as much as we look for new ways to generate employment, new ways to generate economic growth, De-risking, with the stroke of a pen, could wipe out the entire industry. And I'm happy you brought up CIP. I'll get to your answer. But I want to touch on two controversial industries right now. One being CIP and one being medical marijuana. So as much as you have places and countries moving into those programs... A correspondent bank could simply say, you know what, I'm not comfortable with CIP, so we out. And immediately the industry dies before it even gets started. Same with medical marijuana. As much as it's available in some states in America, federally it's against the law. Right? So these businesses are confined to their states and must bank with state banks, but they can't bank with global banks. Jamaica has pressed ahead, and they are having challenges growing the industry because of correspondent banking arrangements. So correspondent banking, as much as we try to innovate locally, as much as we try to seek new avenues and new industries, it has the potential to just say, bring everything crashing down by just a stroke of a pen. Now with regards to CIP, the correspondent banks are not happy with CIP programs. Um, the Canadian banks won't touch it. And our correspondent banks have said to us, well, we are not that comfortable with it. They're not saying don't go into it, but you can understand what they mean when they say we aren't that comfortable with it. So the question is, if the banks are running away from CIP, how will CIP ever get off its feet? Okay. Um, there are a lot of opportunities that it will present. But we are being kept out of it for fear of losing a correspondent bank. So it's a very touchy subject and it's one that we have to employ a lot of diplomacy uh, with, with regards to government, with regards to the CIP agency itself, with regards to correspondent banking. Um, but we are in discussions to see how we can come to a, a, a common ground on the way forward. But it's something that if the correspondents aren't happy with, you don't venture to do business with. It's as simple as that. We've now come to the end of today's special edition of First National Bank Notes. However, stay tuned for part two of the annual Stanley Friends Shareholder Education Forum for more interesting discussion on the topic of de-risking. And don't forget, we are open every Saturday morning from 8 a.m. to 12 noon at our various locations. You can view this show again right here every Wednesday on HCS at 8 p.m. or visit us at www. 
firstnationalbankonline.com. Hope you enjoyed it. I'm Sheridan Plummer. See you next time. And remember, First National Bank is here for you.